Good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Ellen, and I'm an MPT PhD student at the University of British Columbia, as well as a research trainee at Arthritis Research Canada. Before we begin, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that Arthritis Research Canada's headquarters are located on the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the tsleil nations. We express our gratitude for all the keepers of the land across Canada. And today I'm truly thrilled to be your moderator for the webinar with Dr. Jasmine Ma, our strength training expert. This webinar is a part of the Arthritis Research Education Series, Episode 10, titled Strong with Arthritis. The focus is on using customized physical activity prescriptions to increase participation in strength training. If you're joining us for the first time, the Arthritis Research Education Series was created by our Arthritis Patient Advisory Board. And the purpose is to demonstrate how research can impact the lives of those living with arthritis. We will play the video for this episode at the end of today's webinar. It's also available on our website. And after the presentation, there will be a Q&A session. Please look to the lower right side of your screen. There you'll find the Q&A icon. We're gonna uh, warn everyone that the chat function is not available for today. But what we'll ask you to do is to leave your questions there as they come up or use the upvoting feature by clicking the thumbs up icon beside the question that you would like Dr. Ma to answer. As well, please be uh, cautious as we are unable to answer any questions that could be interpreted as medical advice. We ask that you speak to your healthcare provider if you do have any specific questions. Now I get to welcome Dr. Jasmine Ma, who is an assistant professor of teaching in the School of Kinesiology at the University of British Columbia, a clinician investigator with Arthritis Research Canada, an investigator with the International Collaboration on Repair Discoveries, and a kinesiologist herself. She teaches and provides training in the areas of exercise prescription and physical activity behavior change. Her research and education leadership activities include three areas of focus, implementing experiential learning opportunities in community-based exercise settings, co-developing knowledge translation tools for clinicians to promote and prescribe physical activity for people with chronic disease and disability, and advancing the methodology of physical activity counseling and tailoring, particularly for people with arthritis and spinal cord injury. On a personal note, you'll find her on the beach, playing volleyball, bike touring, active community, or eating a donut. Fun fact, she's never had a cup of coffee, if you guys would believe it, and she attributes her energy to being fully funded by exercise-induced endorphins. Now, please put your hands together and join me in welcoming Dr. Jasmine Ma. Thank you, Ellen, for the warm introduction. I feel like I need to stop telling people about my weird coffee thing because um, people are going to start thinking that I'm weird. <laughs> In any case, thank you all so much for being today. I'm incredibly excited to share a little bit about um, my passion and strength training, and, and hopefully we can uh, have a good conversation at the end of this. So I'll be the talking head in your window. Uh, for the next 20 to 25 minutes, and then we'll open it up for conversation. So look forward to that. And of course, a big thank you to Arthritis Research Canada and the University of British Columbia allowing me to be here today. <clears throat> so what we'd like to do um, today, I want to talk about the benefits of strength training for people with arthritis. Um, so what do we get out of it? Um, but also talk about how, you know, sometimes it's hard. So how can we support people to do strength training? And then how do we actually do it? <laughs> so some tips and tricks and some strategies here. So let's start with the benefits. Now, I just want to make a note. Um, my research does largely focus um, in working with people with rheumatoid arthritis. However, a lot of the things that we do talk about today um, certainly apply to other forms of arthritis. So um, you can keep tuning in, tuning in, even if you don't have rheumatoid arthritis, a lot of these principles apply. 
So let's talk about some numbers here, right? Arthritis, it's, it's serious, right? One in five people have arthritis in Canada. And of those people, 40% experience pain that actually limit their activities. And we see that individuals with arthritis are twice as likely to have anxiety or depression. Now, if we look at rheumatoid arthritis in particular, um, there's this, what we call sarcopenia, which is a progressive condition, which basically is where we've got a decline, not only in how much muscle we have, but the strength that we have. And this is a really, it's a very serious condition here where um, this can lead to increased risk for disability, uh, rates of falls, cardiovascular disease, and even death, right? So this is really an important point to note that for people with rheumatoid arthritis, they're 16 times more likely to have sarcopenia than other health conditions. And in fact, of all self-reported health conditions, people with rheumatoid arthritis are the most likely to have sarcopenia. Now, I'm not saying this to be all doom and gloom, <laughs> but I'm just stressing how important it is to do strength training because strength training is one of the best ways that we can help prevent or reduce the decline related to sarcopenia. And we're gonna talk about some other benefits as well. But before we get into that, first of all, what is strength training? So strength training is moving against resistance for the purposes of improving our, our muscle strength. And we can get fancy and we can go to the gym and we can have fancy machines, but we also don't have to be that fancy, right? We can do strength training outside. We can do it out of the comfort of our own homes where we might use things like body weight or um, resistance bands. And even we can get creative with some of our household items, right? Cans can be uh, a free weight. We've loaded up backpacks with books to make things a bit heavier. And we've even had broomsticks where we hang um, bags off the end to make something like a barbell. So it doesn't have to be an expensive activity. The other thing that I wanna make sure that we're on the same page about is that sometimes there's this misconception that strength training is unsafe, but I wanna be really clear that strength training is safe even at high intensities, so long as we are meeting ourselves with where we're at and progressing appropriately. So there is a, a, an important component here of making sure that we are um, making expert exercise prescriptions that are, that are at um, the right dose and intensity, but we can work together to make strength training safe, certainly. So the take home from this slide here is that the benefits of exercise far outweigh the risks even people with chronic conditions like arthritis. So talking about the benefits, right? If we look specifically for people with rheumatoid arthritis, we can see reductions in pain and we see this in other types of arthritis as well, uh, decreases in fatigue. We know that cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death among people with rheumatoid arthritis and the population more broadly. We also see improvements in strength, of course. Makes sense, strength training improves strength. We sure hope so. <laughs> uh, our ability to do our activities of daily living and also our ratio of muscle versus fat in the body. These can all be improved through strength training with people with rheumatoid arthritis and other types of arthritis. And more generally, right? We talked about that sarcopenia so we can help address that. We can help to improve mental health and we can also help to decrease the risk for other chronic conditions like type two diabetes cancer and frailty. So we understand that strength training, it's certainly important for us. There are lots of benefits, but that's not to say that it's, that it's easy, right? We certainly have to acknowledge that there are challenges to strength training. So hopefully we can help, um, help us navigate some of those challenges here today. So the guidelines are, we recommend strength training at least twice a week. So focusing on all of our major active muscle groups, can we do that twice a week? Now, that being said, very few people that's in the general population, but also among populations with arthritis actually do strength training. We're looking at about one to 14%, depending on the country um, that we're, we're looking at the data from. And that's because there's so many things that get in the way. So this isn't necessarily meant for you to <laughs> go and read all of these um, these boxes, but it's all to say that we've identified almost 50 different things that affect whether or not we do strength training. So these can be things like, um, barriers for the individual, like disease symptoms. That's a big one. Thinking about, um, how pain and fatigue can be a barrier, right? Sometimes we're also worried of doing more damage. 
Um, and even things like their effects of medication, like brain fog, these can, these can be things that make it uh, difficult for the individual to exercise. But there are also things that are outside of us as individuals that make, could potentially make strength training hard. Um, do our exercise professionals have the training and support themselves to be able to know how to work with people with arthritis? Um, some folks have a misunderstanding of arthritis um, and how to manage and prescribe exercise with that. And classes, it can be hard to find exercise classes that are appropriate uh, for people with arthritis. So lots of other factors here, but I'm, the point that I wanna make here is that um, we really don't want a victim blame here. There are lots of reasons why we, we do or don't strength training. It's not just because we don't want to. Um, there are lots of reasons and that's where we come in to hopefully help support. So if I were to give you just some general tips and tricks about um, what helps people to strength train, um, first things first, as I've mentioned before, um, start with where you're at and make small changes. So taking small steps. Doing strength training is something that we want to do for the rest of our lives. So we don't have to hit it hard and fast right from the get-go. Be prepared for trial and error. Finding out what your limits are, it's like your own mini experiment. We're all researchers at heart, right? Um, so it can be helpful to run these experiments using monitoring. And um, I'm not here today to talk about the Operas app, but one of my colleagues, Dr. Linda Lee uh, and her team have developed an excellent app. If you're interested, uh, you can take a look at the Arthritis Research Canada website to learn more about an app that can help you monitor your physical activity and um, your disease conditions and help to establish some patterns to help you figure out this trial and error and knowing what your limits are. Our flexibility in our programming. We are going to have good days and we're going to have bad days. So being flexible on the days where maybe we need a little bit more time, um, maybe we need to take things a little bit easier and that's okay. And then lastly, thinking about how we can work together between our clients with arthritis and exercise professionals. This really is a team-based approach. And I'll go into that a little bit more in a bit at the end. So you might be thinking, you know, you get up in the morning, and you're thinking, okay, will I strength train today? Then there are all these things that get in the way and we're thinking about. So I just wanna go through maybe um, some strategies for managing some of these common things that, that come up when we're making that decision about strength training today. So pain is a big one, right? So starting up with a warm up and a cool down can help to prevent some of this pain. But also what you're scheduling, right? Are there times in which your medication is most effective or your pain is least severe? You don't have to do the exercise exactly as it's prescribed. Do what's right for you. So if it means doing smaller movements, if it means decreasing the weight, if it means decreasing the number of times that you lift that weight or what sort of equipment you use, um, I like to call it choosing your own adventure. And as I mentioned about monitoring, um, one of the things that you could do is monitor on a scale of one to 10 or zero to 10. How are you feeling in terms of your pain? And you wanna have an understanding of what that feels like before you start the workout, during the workout, after, and then at different time points following up as much as two days later to start to get an understanding of how you're responding to that exercise. So pain is complicated. Um, so just some general broad strokes to help guide, you know, what is good pain versus bad pain. So if you've got a little bit of discomfort in the muscles or joints during or just after exercise, that's not uncommon. And it doesn't necessarily mean that joints are being damaged. Okay. The other thing is where we do start to maybe consider, oh, maybe I need to change something is if we are experiencing that pain in the joint and we're seeing it two hours after exercise or more, and that is at an increased level than before we started the exercise, then maybe that's a sign that we want to be reducing the intensity of the exercise at our next or our future sessions. Now, the other thing that kind of throws a whole wrench into this that makes it complicated with strength training is we get this thing, what's called DOMS or delayed onset muscle soreness. And this is really common, um, especially if we're starting and doing something new with exercise. So you might feel this, this soreness, 
um, in your muscles. And that is totally normal. Um, it's a, it's a typical part of the process, especially if we are new to exercise, but the key here is those DOMS, um, you're going to notice it in the muscle rather than in the joint. So it's still uncomfortable, but usually if you start to, to <laughs> warm those muscles back up again, um, they start to move again, but it, it is a bit uncomfortable and it does get better over time. I promise. <laughs> okay. Getting into some, uh, what about stiffness? Right. So same thing, we can look at timing of our exercise. I know some people experience morning stiffness. So maybe we don't plan for our exercise first thing in the morning if we need some time to loosen up. But also there can be some strategies to help reduce stiffness. So stretching is often the first thing that we think of, but I just want to be mindful that if you have a joint that is swollen or hypermobile, we are not stretching those joints. And I'm going to get into that a little bit more in the, in the flaring section. Um, but we can go through comfortable and active range of motion. You can do things like massage, uh, foam rolling. And we've even heard that sometimes taking a warm shower can help to decrease stiffness. Now medications, uh, we can't cover the full gamut of medications and their side effects here, but just some common ones that we see um, in relation to exercise. So if you are taking an immunosuppressive drug, um, like your DMARDs or your biologics, right? That can increase your risk for infection, right? So it's good to have this conversation with your health and exercise professional. In any case, we would likely be asking you those questions anyways about which medications you're taking. Um, but just to be really good that ourselves are sick, just to make sure that we reschedule, um, making sure that we're are cleaning our surfaces. On the note of scheduling, right? Uh, there are there's wax and wanes to medications. So if you have an idea of when your meds might be potentially wearing off, for example, the week prior to your next injection, then maybe we don't plan for a really high intensity exercise that week. Maybe we plan for something a little lighter and more manageable. Now, many people experience brain fog um, as a side effect. And that's really kind of on us as, as exercise professionals to make sure that we are communicating our exercise prescriptions in a way that makes sense um, and in a way that we can remember. So did we actually physically give you a program with perhaps pictures, um, even the names of exercises? There, there are some weird names out there for exercises and they don't always resonate with us. So, you know, I, I know I've had a client in the past, you know, we were doing med ball overhead rotations and she was like, I am never going to remember that. I would like to call those helicopter wheelie birds. And I'm like, yes, sure. We're going to write that down as helicopter wheelie birds, whatever helps you to remember. Cause at the end of the day, we want to make sure that that program is right for um, the people that are actually using the prescription. Um, the last thing I'll note here on medications here is if you're taking cortisone injections periodically, just to be mindful, not to strength train in the area where it was injected, uh, usually for two to seven days after the injection. Okay. So flare up, I think this is where, um, you know, most of the, the hesitation is in, in prescribing strength training. So I want to just um, clarify a couple thoughts here. So when your joint is in a flare where you would typically see, you know, it's, it's painful, um, there's lots of swelling, it's, it's hot to touch, right? Then we want to shift the focus to strengthening the muscles that surround the joints that are less affected. So for example, if we had um, a flare-up in our knee, then maybe we want to focus on strengthening the muscles near the hip instead. So you might be doing something like, you know, lying on your side, doing your Jane Fonda exercises. Um, so we're essentially kind of taking out that knee joint from any sort of um, strength training. However, um, the joints that are affected and are experiencing this inflammation, we can still take them through range of motion, but we just want to make sure that it's in tolerable ranges and the available range that you have. So again, we're, we're not stretching or stressing um, the inflamed joint. Break it up. It doesn't have, have to happen all at once. If you want to chunk it in your day, um, you absolutely will still see benefits. So just to reiterate here, right? And maybe to also bring this more specifically to gripping, right? If we have an inflamed joint, um, one of the mistakes we'll often see is particularly in the hands. Um, there's a lot of gripping in strength training. We'll talk about some different pieces of equipment that we can use, but maybe just being mindful that any sort of tight gripping, um, you know, we don't want to uh, extend the joint beyond its limits as far as it's already, already um, swollen. So just being mindful that maybe on those days where if we've got 
you know, a flare in their hands, um, or being more mindful to avoid some of that tight ripping. The last thing I'll talk about here in terms of symptoms is fatigue. So program extra wet, extra rest, be okay to take rest. That's either within your session and even sometimes uh, between days, you know, we don't have to strength train, you know, one day after the other, maybe we want to, you know, uh, cycle in some walking or wheeling on the next day to give ourselves a rest. But I just want to address expectations, you know, William Shakespeare, expectation is the root of all heartache. Doing less when you're fatigued, that is okay, right? At the end of the day, doing something will always be better than nothing. Okay, so now we're gonna move into our last section here and talk about what we can actually do for strength training. So some of the um, kind of tricky words that you might hear about with strength training, you might hear things like sets and repetitions. So the repetitions are essentially the number of times that you repeat the exercise and the set is the grouping of those repetitions. So how many times um, when you do a set, you're going to do those repetitions all together without taking a break. And then you take a break and then you might start your next set. So when we're thinking about our sets or our groupings, start with just one, right? Um, and then you can progress to doing more sets to perhaps three sets. Our repetitions, we typically recommend that you start with higher repetitions, but the key here is those high repetitions mean lower weights, even if that means body weight, right? And then as we progress and we're feeling stronger and we're more comfortable and um, the body has adapted to strength training, then we can start lifting those heavier weights at lower repetitions, say six to 12 repetitions. Now, I think the most, the most challenging concept to grasp in exercise prescription is intensity. So intensity, there are lots of different ways to measure intensity, but for strength training specifically, there are a couple, a couple ways that we can help you with that. So one, we can use something like this scale of zero to 10, where zero is, you know, I'm chilling, watching my Netflix, although Netflix is now more expensive. So maybe it's Amazon Prime, what have you, or we're just, you know, sitting on a bench outside and drinking the nature. Um, and 10 is extremely hard. So the heaviest thing you've ever lifted, right? So where does that kind of sit on that scale of zero to 10? So I've oftentimes asking you the question, or you ask yourself the question on a scale of zero to 10, how hard am I working? And if it's a good day today, can you aim for at least that six to seven out of 10? So that moderate intensity or that's somewhat hard. But if today is not your day, that's okay. And it needs to be something less. Again, something is better than nothing. Now, another strategy that we can use to measure intensity is what's called repetitions in reserve. So same thing at the end of a set, you can ask yourself the question, how many more reps did I have left in the tank? How many more could I have done? So if the answer to that is I could keep going for a long time, or it's kind of something more than four to six reps, you really have no idea, it's, you can't measure it, it might be a sign that your weight is too light. So you might want to increase the weight a bit. Okay, so now we have a little bit of an understanding of some of those exercise parameters. Um, let's get into some of the things that we might actually do. So first things first, we want to start with a warm up, And one of the things that I love about a warm up is it gives us a scan for how we're moving and feeling today. So if today is a good day, then okay, maybe we push our intensity a bit today. If today's not a good day, and it means, you know what, actually, I think the only exercises that I can manage for today are lying in my bed. Again, something is better than nothing. So that warm up can help us to get a sense of how we're feeling today. Now, if you're structuring your own warm up, you want to be thinking about ramp. <laughs> so I know my mom, my mom has knee osteoarthritis and she always tells me how she's going to pickleball. I'm like, okay, mom, make sure you remember your ramp warm up. <laughs> so I'm always telling her about raising your heart rate. So getting those muscles warm. Can we do something um, like marching, um, doing our arm swings, um, going and starting with walking, getting our heart rate up or activating the muscles. So um, can we start to use the muscles that we're going to use in that workout? So if I'm thinking of my mom and her pickleball, she's doing a lot of, you know, moving to the side, you know, lunging to the front. Can we start to activate some of those muscles that are involved in that? Are mobilizing our joints. And key here is that we're mobilizing or moving our joints through how far they can move through a safe range of motion. So making sure that that's tolerable. 
And then the P stands for potentiate, which is basically meaning that we're slowly increasing the intensity. So instead of, you know, starting here and then start from the bottom now here, uh, <laughs> going straight into your main workout, you want to slowly increase your intensity. So you're ramping yourself up to be ready to exercise. So these are just some examples of different warm up exercises that we do, uh, all found in the iCERT toolkit, which I'll share with you at the end. So some other special considerations, um, particularly for rheumatoid arthritis, we are mindful of making sure that we're also activating ankles. So some people have trouble with, you know, bringing their toes up towards their shins, our rotator cuffs. So those are our, our shoulder muscles. Can we do things like internal and external rotation? Our hip external rotators, um, you might've heard your physiotherapist or an exercise professional talk about targeting your glute med. So those are the ones that, you know, get your, your leg to come out to the side um, and really help to stabilize your hips and, and even help to stabilize the knee. Um, and sometimes wrists too. We might be thinking, you know, are my wrists painful? If they're in a flexed position, do we wanna keep those wrists a little bit more neutral when we're doing our exercises? So those are the general principles that I'm thinking of for a warm up. Now let's get into the main workout. So when I'm thinking through programming the main workout, I'm asking myself these questions. Am I including the following really foundational movements? So one, am I using push movements? So am I doing things that look like opening a door? Two, Am I doing pull movements? Are those exercises or those things that look like, you know, if you're pulling garden weeds, you know, out of the ground? Three, am I squatting or lunging? So those are the things like when we're getting in and out of the chair. Four is those hinge movements. So kind of like that bowing motion, right? If we're bending over to pick something up off the ground, um, that's a really important movement. And then these other ones here, um, so our lateral, so being able to step to the side, you know, moving outwards and then our rotation and anti-rotation. So that might be looking like, you know, if you're, um, at the side of your car and putting your baby in the car seat. So these are really our foundational movements and you almost all of the exercise kind of get classified within one of these categories. So one way you might think of this is you might take one of these foundational movements. Let's say we took the hinge, right? And I like to say, choose your own adventure. <laughs> so these are, for example, on the right here, three different exercises you could choose within a hinge. So on the easier side, um, we might choose something like a glute bridge where you're lying on your back and your knees are bent and you're squeezing your butt to raise your hips up in the air and basically make kind of a plank in the air while you're on your back. Um, and that might be something that we do to start. And then over time, as we get stronger and more comfortable with the movement, then we might progress ourselves all the way over to a kettlebell swing where we kind of take that bowing motion and add some power and speed to it. So this might be something where maybe one day that kettlebell swing was working really well for you, um, but then the next you know, couple of days you weren't doing so well. So maybe we wanna bring that down and pick another exercise within that hinge um, category. It's really dependent on how you're feeling that day or where you're at in your experience and can we progress you along that continuum, but also be prepared to take steps backwards if we need to. So those are our foundational movements. And you can basically pick any of those exercises and make them easier or harder using these principles. So one is the intensity. So let's say we took the squat, right? That's that movement that's getting in and out of your chair. So do we have to do the full squat or can we do a quarter squat today? How many squats are we doing in that time? So in 30 seconds, am I doing 20 squats or am I doing closer to five squats, right? How long am I holding a squat in that bottom position for a longer time? Or am I adding weight or not using anything beyond my body weight in that intensity for the squat? As a general rule, in terms of equipment, body weight, resistance bands, and machines are typically easier than free weights or dumbbells. Our support can also be something that we use to make an exercise easier or harder. So again, coming back to that squat example, am I holding on to something for support? Or am I doing something, a double leg versus a single leg squat? I think you can guess probably which one is harder, uh, the single leg squat. <clears throat> and then the complexity. So the squat involves multiple joints, but maybe we're not ready for the squat and that's okay. So maybe we wanna break that down to a single joint. So for example, um, extending our knee so that it's straight and do something like a knee extension. Or 
we might combine exercises if we want to make it more complicated. So we take that squat and then we add a shoulder press or where we're bringing weights above our head in combination with that squat. So all one exercise, but you can completely blow it up into making it easier or harder thinking through these different principles. Last thing I'll sort of mention here in terms of general recommendations here is just to be flexible, right? You can give yourself ranges um, in how many sets you do or how many reps or what your intensity should feel like. And I'll oftentimes think about programming for a good day and programming for a bad day um, in terms of our symptoms. So be flexible. Now I mentioned I was gonna talk about some adaptive devices. These aren't an exhaustive list. Um, but are certainly some of um, the common ones that we'll see and work with our clients with. So these first ones you see here are all around helping us to grip. So sometimes folks can find it helpful to use padded gloves when holding weights. Uh, it can be helpful to, if you've got a, a free weight that has a really small narrow handle, um, that requires quite a bit of tight gripping. So sometimes we've taken a face towel and tape is your best friend, <laughs> duct tape, um, tape the towel on there. so it provides some cushion, but also um, expands the grip a little bit more so that we're not gripping quite so tight. You can also take grip out of the equation and use things like wrist hooks where the weight is now bared within uh, by the wrist. You can use cuff weights where the weight, the weight is directly attached to the wrist so it doesn't require any grip. And I can't take full credit for this other one here. Um, I borrowed this from, from one of my clients with spinal cord injury. So kudos to, to Marnie for this idea. Um, but if you're using resistance bands, you know, sometimes when we wrap the loops at the end, that can be one solution. But another one is if you've ever seen those, you know, cool uh, wrist sweat bands, you can tie uh, the resistance band to a sweat band, slip that on in another way to, to reduce having to grip. Other ideas, using splints and tensors. Um, if you're having trouble getting depth in your squat, sometimes we'll use blocks under the heels, but we can also modify some things with the technique in the squat to help with that as well. And then sometimes things like adaptive shoes or insoles. Okay, so all of the information that I've shared with you today and more are included in the iStart toolkit, which is um, a set of complementary guides for both the health and exercise professional, as well as for clients. And that's to say that we're meant to have a collaborative conversation together. Um, we're, we're both driving the bus in different areas of expertise here. Now, it's not available just yet. So cliffhanger here, but it will be available in summer 2023. And everyone registered for this webinar will receive a link to download once it is available. But just to summarize everything we talked about today. Strength training, it is safe for people with arthritis. We just need some help to dose it appropriately and think about meeting us with where we're at and taking small, small changes from there. Use your warm up. It's a great tool to scan how you're feeling that day, but be flexible and kind with yourself. If today is not your day, remember that doing something is better than nothing. When you're thinking of your movements, am I pushing? Am I pulling? Am I squatting? And I hint and am I hinging? And am I also taking care of things like my shoulders, ankles, and getting my butt or my glute need, um, those things that help us to move the leg uh, out to the side? Uh, are we getting those firing? And then lastly, I'll always remember this um, conversation that I had with one of our, our patient and clinician partners. Alison Hoons, you know, we always say, <laughs> well, I have, you know, a PhD in exercise science, our, our partners and, and clients, um, they come in with a PhD in lived experience. So we both have really important pieces of the conversation to offer um, on the table when we're designing a strength and exercise program. So a big thank you to our team. We have a rock star team here, including uh, patient partners, clinician partners, as well as uh, researchers, and I am very excited to now answer some questions. Jasmine, I just want to say thank you for very comprehensive, but also just so easy to understand um, fashion. I think there's so many things in there that we can really take and implement, and we're going to hopefully use this Q&A session to really hit home some of those key points that you had mentioned and repeated, especially doing something is better than nothing. But how do we do something and how do we make it safe? 
how do we start to make it enjoyable if we don't enjoy it from the beginning? <laughs> and how does we make it serve us in the movement that we want to do, right? Because I think mm-hmm. you made a really good point. Like, there's no need to go to the gym. If, you're, if your goal <laughs> isn't to squat or lift X amount of weight, why, why, why would we train like that? If my goal yeah. isn't to walk without pain, then I should be training loss specificity. That's right. <laughs> or to clean the dishes without pain. So with that, I'm going to start with a general question that I'm kind of feeling um, there, there's a need to do a little bit of an explanation from, from your exercise physiology when I asked you to put that on that hat. <laughs> um, oh, my apologies. I'm going to invite Eileen Davidson, who's a member of Arthritis no. Research Canada's Patient Advisory Board. So one of the reasons why we're all here today, one of the original individuals who actually fought and led for this initiative. So she will be helping to answer our questions. And Eileen, she was actually involved in the iStart project from the very beginning. As a so incredibly knowledgeable, as Dr. Maud said, a PhD in lived experiences. That's so right. with that question for you both, um, and I think this one will be really nice to touch on from both ends, but mm. We, we can understand why putting more pressure on joints by doing exercise, like that's very easy for us to conceptualize, will cause us more pain. Mm. Could you speak to how when you move and the, 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 the notion that motion is lotion, <sighs> or when you do move, how, how it actually improves? And Eileen, can you speak to your experiences? I remember a really great um, conversation that we, we had, a very brief one, but a really great conversation about it's not so fun at the beginning and you almost have to listen to your body and work through that. And at some point it gets your body adapts. I want to, I'm going to use those words. Um, Jasmine, can you, can you start us off with, with, with uh, that question, please? Yeah, that's a great question, Ellen. So just thinking about, yeah, how doing things like strength training helps us to move, helps to protect our joints. Um, so for one, you know, when you think about a joint, um, there are muscles that surround it. There are some, you know, tendons and ligaments. And all of these tissues, so muscles, tendons, ligaments, and bone, um, they all respond to what's asked of them. So if we are asking it to be able to handle more load over time, as we, we progress that, you know, bit by bit, then it will respond in a way that, okay, I also need to get stronger for that. Right. So it essentially helps us to protect our joints, makes, you know, makes our tissues stronger. The other thing that it does is the itself. Right. Movement requires um, blood flow to the area to supply it with the energy that it needs for us to be able to move. And blood flow is really important for flushing out some of those um, different things that sometimes can be, uh, you know, make us feel stiff. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's the combination of the movement and the blood flow and also how our tissues basically respond to what we ask it to do. But I think Eileen's, you know, I think the, the lived experience on this one, um, Eileen, you've got a great story about how exercise has helped you and how you feel. Yeah, really happy to be here today because it was um, this program and being involved in this research is how I learned to exercise with rheumatoid arthritis. And once I kind of learned how to do it properly and see the benefits of it, I have fallen in love with exercise. But the beginning stages is probably the hardest part is getting started. And I like to say like the first two weeks kind of suck. Um, you're dealing with the motivation, you're dealing with organizing what exercises you can or want to do, how to do them. Um, and it does hurt a little bit more at the beginning, but that pain tends to go away. And what I find is I start to really crave exercise because of how it makes me feel and how much easier it actually does get after a few weeks. And um, to my surprise, I would have to add more weight and everything. So while there is that negative voice in my head telling me, oh, well, I'm going to be causing more fatigue or pain, it actually does the opposite. But the first, you know, the first days into it, I might need a nap. I might need to go slow. I might need to break it up throughout the day rather than diving headfirst into it. Um, and you have to give it time, just like our medications over time, you'll see the benefits and you'll feel it. Thank you both for that, that really comprehensive answer. Once again, I, I love that we're answering from both sides, right? Knowing that it, it will be uncomfortable and it's not always fun and building habits isn't easy. 
but to know that there's science there to say that it is beneficial, we have to also have to honor ourselves and say, you know what, I'm going to show some self-compassion. I really don't need to hit seven. I just hit, hit seven as an arbitrary number. I'm going to do three and sit here and be super proud of mm -hmm. three reps of whatever I do. So thank you for that. Um, diving into kind of the bulk area of questions, which is, um, I'm trying to summarize uh, for, for our audience, but You've got a tough job, Ellen. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there's just so many great questions here on specific joints, looking at specific pain points or fatigue or um, clicking or discomfort. How do we know? And this is a difficult question. I, I absolutely I acknowledge that. How do we know when to stop? If, if there's pain in the ankle, pain in the shoulder, pain in the back, like at what point do we say, do I stop? Especially if I'm I'm new to something and I'm just starting. Like, what yeah. is that? What is that line? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wonder, Eileen, if you wanted to start with your own experience and then I can share maybe just some general guidelines too. But I think it is very um, unique to the individual. So maybe if Eileen, you want to share your experience. Yeah, so... I can't emphasize more on that warm up. That warm up will tell you how you feel that day. So I find if I'm going to do a warm up and I struggled to do that warm up, I don't want to do any more after it, then I'm having a bad day and I'm just going to go slow. Um, but if I crave more time of doing my warm up, so I use a treadmill for my warm up, just so everybody knows. Um, if I crave wanting to do more or if I want to run during my warm up, then I'm having a good day. But those bad days, my body feels, it typically actually hits me in fatigue, not necessarily pain. Um, the fatigue is a huge indicator that I'm not having a good day. And that can be affected by a number of things. My medications, it could be a week or so before my period when I start to experience more uh, pain and fatigue. It could also be the weather here in BC, especially with gray, gloomy, rainy days. Or it could be my mental health. Maybe I'm having something going on that's causing me a lot of stress. So I'm just physically exhausted and mentally exhausted. So it's just kind of trying to figure out, well, I'm not going to push myself on those days where I have really high fatigue because I have other things in life. But maybe how can I incorporate exercise into those days so I'm continually moving? And maybe I will only do one set of an exercise because that's all I can do that day. And it will get better another day. Yeah, and thanks, Eileen. I'm glad you're pointing out, you know, the importance of warm up to help you make those decisions. And I'm always mindful, you know, I, do, I don't want to give a number to things to say, you know, if we're on that scale of zero to 10, if you're this number, that's no good, because, you know, really kind of centering the, the individual perspective here is that some people will live their lives at a baseline of pain, at five out of 10, three out of 10, what have you. Right. So what that number means is different to the individual. And I think where that comes back to is these two concepts. So one is that trial and error and two is the monitoring. So for you to figure out what is that line um, comes with some trial and error. And, and to do that safely is we start with where you're at. So what kind of how much are you currently doing? Can we do that? And maybe just a little bit more um, and then progress ourselves slowly. And then you monitor. So coming back to how did you feel before you started? What does that pain look like during? What does that pain look like after? And what does that look like, not just immediately after the session, but perhaps, you know, um, 12 hours later or the next day? And if we're seeing that we're getting an unusual pattern for our pain, then that might be an, a sign that, okay, what I did that day was too much. And I've got to go back to the drawing board, back to that trial and error and try something a little bit different. So monitor, you know, use those skills. There, there are things like the Opera app to help you to monitor your, your disease uh, symptoms, including pain and how that is interfacing with the other things that you're doing in life, not just physical activity, but, you know, it could be things like your diet or, um, you know, other stressors and things in your life as well. It's a really great point that you bring up. It's not simply, you know, I'm not feeling good today. What else is going on in that moment? Mm -hmm. um, and I do want to dig a little bit deeper on one point you had mentioned, which is the, the idea of progressing or going slowly or mm -hmm. taking small steps. And I think we mm -hmm. 
we as a as a society get this wrong we're like oh when we when you have the idea of taking small steps you think okay i'm going to start by running three kilometers it's like no 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 um it, starting small i think don't even think small think like micro and and there's more and more research to back this up the the forming a habit right understanding as eileen said it, it will take so much so much time um but finding things that you enjoy showing yourself that compassion but also breaking it up mm -hmm. super, super small um yeah. i mean i'm going to direct this question to you like i'm gonna i'm gonna zoom in i'm gonna ask, ask <laughs> you on a little bit component of your life so when you were building those exercise habits um what were kind of like the first steps did you that you take did you you know simply start with a little bit of breathing and then the first month and a half was just very much so body weight exercises just so you're getting familiar with the movement patterns like how did you do that slow safe progression um well i did not start safely <laughs> or slowly <laughs> i i was I was under misconceptions. I didn't have guidance from a healthcare professional on how to exercise, but I wanted to exercise. So I started going to the gym and I did the elliptical because I read an article that it was low impact exercise and that it would help uh, benefit people living with arthritis. And it was one that I actually felt comfortable doing. However, I pushed myself too much on it and I expected myself to be doing it every day for a minimum of 30 minutes, which is actually very aggravating to somebody who has uncontrolled RA at that time. So it was trial and error for sure. Um, and then I found, you know, the, the proper exercise professionals that would teach me how to do exercise effectively, because I'd also try things online, but I'm not picking up on proper posture. I'm not picking up on, you know, how to do things specifically with rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and over time, I will, I will mention one thing with rheumatoid arthritis. It is a progressive disease. It's a lifelong disease and it is bumpy. There's things that can stop us from exercise, surgery, really bad flares, medications stop working for us, infections, all sorts of things. Injuries can stop us from e exercising the way we want to and throw us off. So I'm consistently having to what I call rejuvenate myself and get back into exercise when something these bumps happen. And I just start with doing 10 minutes, do that warm up, see how I feel. If my body can crave more, if I'm starting to feel better from that warm up, then I'll keep going. But my body now, I can recognize when I need to stop. Typically with cardio, it's my feet, my ankles, and my knees start to feel hot and sort of jelly. That's when I know I have to stop. Absolutely, definitely have to stop. Um, but over time, just adding little bits of more activity into my day really helps. This can not necessarily look like, you know, the treadmill. It might be, well, I have a rheumatologist appointment. So I know that I can take the bus directly right out front of my office, or I can get off earlier and walk, or I can go for a walk after down to the beach and just kind of process everything that's in my appointment or I can, when I'm doing dishes, sometimes I get really sick of doing dishes. So I'll stop and I'll do squats. In my Zoom meetings, I usually have my camera off so I can just exercise while I'm zo doing Zoom meetings. And I've also learned over time that exercise doesn't necessarily always look like having to exercise in a gym or at, you know, with all my equipment. It could be mowing my lawn. It could be you know any chores that I have to do. And of course, exercise is going to make those chores easier. So it's just finding little bits of ways to add it into your day, particularly with, you know, catching up on your steps or saying, you know, I have this habit also when I make my coffee in the morning, I'm going to do 20 squats while I'm waiting for my coffee yeah. to go. And it's just building those little habits over time and how motivating it gets. And it, it does get easier after a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And maybe I'll just add to that because Eileen's got some excellent examples of what you can specifically do um, to add those to your day. And so there is evidence for what we're calling exercise snacking. Um, so you can do, like Eileen said, hey, do your, your 20 squats. Um, maybe you've got a break in between meetings or what have you. Um, maybe it's getting up and going for a walk or a wheel um, for a few minutes. So the snacking is, is certainly important. Um, in terms of safe progression, just to give some numbers to things. Um, and again, these numbers are meant to be just guidelines and recommendations. You really have to take it for what's right for you. 
Um, first things first is before I'm progressing and, and you know making things harder, I'm always looking at number one, do we have good technique? Because we want to make sure that we have good and safe technique before we start to add more weight. So that's one thing. Um, the second thing is we have a couple of, um, I guess, kind of tricks for thinking about how you might move to the next stage and make things a little bit harder. Um, the first one is the five to 10% rule. So if you're looking at your weight, um, you know, the next time we bump up our weight, we typically don't do any more than say five to 10%, but that is a very loose rule. So I don't typically use that one all that uh, to be all that helpful. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's a little bit of trial by fire. The other one is what's called the two for two rule. So let's say in, say you had a bicep curl, right? And you were meant to do 10 reps at a given weight. And the last two sessions, you're able to do 12 reps instead of the 10. So two more reps than what you're originally prescribed. That might be a sign that it's a time to increase your weight. So that's the two for two rule for the last two sessions. Have you been doing two more reps than what was originally prescribed? Then maybe we need to increase the weight or do something different um, to increase the intensity. So brilliant. I, I love how you guys came at this question from a very different perspective than the way I asked it. Yeah. Right? <laughs> that's why we're a team. <laughs> we're a team. But Eileen, you brought up a point of, again, like I'm thinking you're working towards a certain exercise goal of walking X amount of kilometers where you you had brought, brought in a really beautiful notion of movement can be added anywhere in your day and taking a very integrative approach to this. Um, and that is actually more functional, right? Then, then, then setting aside time to do a specific exercise, right? To integrate it in your day and in, in a lot more realistic. I think that's another point I want to hit home where, mm -hmm. yes, we got to enjoy it, but like we can't physically fit it into our day. And this allows us then physically fit it into our day. Mm -hmm. uh, I will add on to that because living with a chronic illness is a full-time job. It's busy. And then I also work at a computer desk. So I have particularly found getting up and doing these little exercise snacks helps me prevent pain and do more productivity during the day. Um, any, anybody living with arthritis knows that if you sit with bad posture too long, you're going to be giving yourself an increase in pain and fatigue. So I have a setup in my house where everything is easy for me to access. Um, so I can say, okay, I'm starting to feel fatigued. I'm starting to feel a little bit of pain. Can I move this out of me? And it really does help me. And then I'm also not stressing and getting anxious about, or giving myself a guilt trip about not exercising the way we're supposed to, and, you know, uh, social media and whatnot, I'm doing it the way that works for me and my symptoms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think this idea of finding out the way that works for you, we can also come back to um, some principles of behavioral science as well. So, you know, we talked about how there are 50 different things that affect, you know, at least from what we've seen in interviews with people with rheumatoid arthritis, 50 different things. And if you look more broadly, there are actually 200 barriers that we've identified more broadly across all people with physical disability to whether or not we're physically active. So there are lots of reasons. And so, you know, Eileen gives some really great examples of, you know, addressing the, the barrier of time, right? Can we fit it in and have small snacks in the day? Um, but there are other barriers too, right? Some people will say, you know, strength training just isn't that interesting to me. <laughs> um, or, you know, we might, we might be social creatures. So can we structure our exercise in a way that uh, allows us to be more social? Can we be looking at perhaps finding those exercise classes? You know, can we set ourselves up with an exercise buddy um, to hold us a little bit more accountable? If we're having trouble with scheduling, can we set ourselves an action plan where we think, okay, looking at my schedule, what days of the week at what specific time and where would this realistically fit into my schedule? Great. So it's Mondays at 10 a.m. till 1030. I'm going to put it into my calendar and I'm going to set an alarm. So we've got things like prompts and cues. I don't know about you. If it's not in my calendar, I don't show up. So I need those reminders. So yeah, just from a, um, from a behavior change perspective, I'm always thinking about, you know, what are the things that are getting in the way and how can we address them? Um, whether that's your capability, um, the access to things you have, whether it's things related to motivation, can we monitor how we're doing? Can we make a plan? And can we also think about the people in our lives that might help us to stick with our program? 
thank you so much, both of you for adding on there. And I, I just think it's such a rich conversation that what we'll have to do is create a Q&A section when we post yeah. the video on the arthritis website. So we're really able to capture everything that was said. I know there's just so many nuggets of wisdom and I just don't want to lose them. So we're going to tell the audience right now, if you have a question, it was not answered, please check the website once this video is posted and we'll try to answer it there for you, perhaps as a part of a larger uh, question. But with that, um, Eileen, Jasmine, uh, you two are an inspiration to me. And I always learn something, always learn something. Every conversation I have, thank you for sharing your insight uh, with the audience today. And hopefully our audience today will share it with someone they know might find it uh, helpful or useful. And uh, we will now play episode 10, the video for you. It's approximately four minutes long. We're going to ask you to stay with us to learn more about our survey and for the chance to win a gift card. Mm. <laughs> so with that, stay with us, everyone. My name is Lisa Harris and I have rheumatoid arthritis and I was diagnosed in the end of 2015. Pre-symptoms, I was very, very active. I would, I did boot camps, I ran, I was big into snowboarding and everyday activity with my, my children because they were toddlers at that point in time. I started strength training because I know that it is part of a healthy body and one of the things that I did notice that kept me going back to strength training was my joints did feel better. There are many many benefits to strength training. We see improvements in mental health, decreased risk for chronic disease like cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes. Overall, strength training participation rates are low, and that's even for the general population. About a third of the population does strength training regularly. For people with rheumatoid arthritis, really only about 14% do strength training, so it's about half of what we typically see. In terms of resources for strength training for people with rheumatoid arthritis, they were very, very limited. I did do some searching, like through Google, not much came up. Usually it would be an article or a blog from a professional, such as a physio, but actual specific help for a lay person, there wasn't much out there. I did seek out some professional help with a physiotherapist. He's a good barometer as to whether or not I'm pushing too far. Talking to people with rheumatoid arthritis, we've identified 50 different things that play a part in whether or not we strength train. There are some individual factors, so disease-specific symptoms, things like pain and fatigue make it really hard to do strength training. Your medication side effects, even things like brain fog, having trouble remembering what your program is, those are some of the individual factors, but the barriers to strength training extend far beyond the individual. For health and exercise professionals, many of us do not know how to provide that support. One thing I found very helpful was to adapt some of the exercises or use equipment to help me get through an exercise. So we've summarized existing research to have an understanding of how we tailor our approaches for someone with RA, what the guidelines and recommendations are for strength training with rheumatoid arthritis, and what we are currently seeing not just amongst people with rheumatoid arthritis, but more generally around how we support strength training is something that we do long term. So this research is called ISTART, which stands for Improving Strength Training and Tailoring Among People with Rheumatoid Arthritis and we've been developing what's called the iStart Toolkit. So it's a complementary um, tool for both practitioners as well as for patients. And the whole point is to have a guided conversation where we can co-develop an approach to strength training. To me also research is very important because it provides more knowledge, more steps. It, it helps us to live more with this disease, with rheumatoid arthritis. Research is what is going to propel us farther and closer to a cure and also how to live with it in the meantime. 
So for patients, it comes with a checklist of key points to talk about with your health and exercise professional in order for you together to develop an exercise prescription. To anyone who's feeling intimidated to start strength training, I just say start small because any little step that you do is better than what you did yesterday if you did nothing. With that, I just want to give the biggest thanks to our audience for joining us today. We hope you learned something and we kindly ask you to complete a quick survey that will be sent to you. Um, your feedback is really important as it helps us develop, develop future education series episodes. And for everyone who completes the survey by March 30th, you'll be entered into a draw to win a $25 Starbucks gift card. We would now like to acknowledge the Arthritis Research Education Series sponsors for their support, Fresenius, Cabby Canada, Organon, and Beatrice. Finally, a special thank you to our presenter, Dr. Jasmine Ma, as well as Eileen Davidson for joining us. We are grateful to learn more about your research and Eileen, we are so thankful uh, for your lived experiences. For those who haven't had the opportunity to visit our website and check out the Arthritis Research Education Series, I encourage you to do so at arthritisresearch.ca slash learn. We have episodes on a variety of topics as well as research resources, those frequently asked questions and more. Thank you to everyone and have a wonderful rest of your day.